Just to jog your memory, last day we introduced the concept of EMF, which is an abreve for electromotive force, which is a terrible abreve because it's not a force, it's voltage. Generally what we're doing is we're using capital V for voltage when it's done by a battery, by a chemical battery. When it's an induced voltage, that's the fancy word for created from nothing through motion, we tend to use the Greek letter epsilon, the EMF symbol. And Jazz and Deep, we looked at how you can induce motion in a bar or in a wire by moving it through a magnetic field. You could separate charges. You can make one end positive, one end negative. And we said separating charges, that takes work. Some vo motion, some voltage has been created due to motion. But this is a pretty dumb system because you can slide, the, oh, and that gave us a BLV where they all had to be uh, perpendicular to each other. Don't follow, don't worry, I'm just doing a quick recap because it's been a couple of days. The problem with this is how far can you slide the bar in the magnetic field before you run out of magnetic field? There's got to be a better way to induce voltage. But at least we know that we can use motion to create voltage. Faraday came along and he, this was his idea. He came up with the idea of the generator. Uh, fancy word, he called it the dynamo, and I think in Britain they still call it a dynamo, a generator to create electricity from motion. Now, how is it going to work? We have our magnetic field. The lines point from north to south. So in your picture, they're pointing to the right. We're going to spin a coil of wires. So there's rotation. What's causing it to rotate? Uh, maybe water flowing through a turbine or a water wheel or maybe a steam engine and you're using the steam to turn the wheel or a coal fire, a fired power plant or a nuclear power plant all you're doing is you're heating up water and you're using the steam to spin the wheel here in bc most of it is hydroelectric power we're using water from gravity to spin a coil of wires what's going to happen if we do that everybody let's draw our token proton right there on the right side of the coil as it's spinning right there, Ella, it's moving downwards. So everybody point your right thumb downwards. What direction is the magnetic field pointing to the right? Which way will this proton feel a force? It's going to feel a force out of the page. Yes? Oh, and a proton sitting right here. We can't see it because it's hidden by the magnet. But a proton sitting right here would be, I'll do it in red, would be moving upwards. Which way will that proton feel a force? It's going to feel a force into the page. And what you're going to have while this rotation is in place is current flowing this way. And in fact, as this arm moves down, you would see the needle move. You would see the voltage needle move. Hey, we're creating voltage from motion. So the generator was invented by Michael Faraday, also called the dynamo. The previous figure shows a simple hand-operated generator with only one turn of wires, to simplify the explanation. And when it turns, this coil of wires cuts across the magnetic field lines. So let's look down the coil. Here's a down the coil picture. Let's look at the top right here. Here's our proton sitting inside the wires. Right now, it's moving to the right. What direction is the magnetic field pointing, Riley? Also to the... So it's moving parallel to the magnetic field. There will not be any kind of an induced voltage. It won't feel a force, and so it would read zero. Ah, but right here, now that proton is moving down the page. So point your right thumb down the page. Magnetic field line is still pointing to the right. Jacob, you're correct. You'll get a current coming out of the page on the right-hand side, and you'll get a current going into the page on the left-hand side. And so we would see the needle move that way if we were measuring the current coming from the right. What about in picture C? Well, now it's moving this way and this way. We have the same situation as in picture A, jazz and deep. Both sections of the coil are moving parallel to the magnetic fields. The needle would move back to zero. What about in picture D? Well, in picture D, we have a similar situation to uh, picture B, but Alfie, the sides have flipped. What was on the right 
is now on the left. And so if you were measuring the voltage, you would measure a negative voltage. You would measure the current had flipped directions relative to your voltmeter or to your current meter. And what you get is an alternating voltage, an alternating current. It looks an awful lot like a sine wave or a cosine wave. Now, because I can't assume that you've taken principles of math 12, I can't assume that you've seen that before. Some of you have. Some of you, you haven't got to trig yet in principles of math 12. But this is why most of our infrastructure coming out of the power lines is alternating current. It's because alternating current is really, really easy to generate. Spin a coil inside of a magnetic field, and there are lots of clever ways to spin stuff. Okay. Uh, here, we'd be back to zero again. So you would go from zero voltage to maximum voltage to zero voltage to maximum voltage, but negative because it's in the opposite direction of, of the current to zero. So it says when the coil is horizontal, the segments in which an EMF are perpendicular to the lines of force and the induces at its maximum or peak voltage, that would be in picture B or picture D. When the coil is parallel to the lines of force, we end up with no voltage. That would be like in picture A or C or E. Next page. So you get your maximum voltage when the coil is moving across the magnetic fields, perpendicularly to the magnetic fields, and that would be BLV. You get no voltage when the coil is moving parallel to the magnetic fields. That would be zero. So here's the question. How can we combine the induced voltage in a wire, BLV, with this idea of somehow, <coughs> excuse me, inducing voltage in a loop of wire as it spins. Okay. Consider the following example. We have a rectangular loop of wire, and it's moving to the right. Um, by the way, part of my diagram got chopped off. There should be a line right there. Can you all draw that in, please? That's part of the loop of wire. Where will there be an induced current? Well, where will there be an induced voltage? Well, Presley, where will charges feel a force? First of all, in situation A, is there any external magnetic field at all? Be stupid obvious here. So will situation A feel anything at all, Jacob? No, cross out A, and for that matter, cross out F. Now, in situation B, as we enter the magnetic field, this line, this section, and this section, they're running parallel to the velocity. There will be very little voltage induced in those chunks of wire. You can use your right-hand rule to prove that. But there's definitely a proton sitting in this chunk of wire, and it's moving through a magnetic field. What direction is it moving? Well, what direction is the loop moving? To the new G I'm looking for that starts letter R. So everybody point your right thumbs to the right. What direction is the magnetic field? What do those dots mean? Out of the page. Which way will it feel a force? It will feel a force downwards. Will this section of wire at the back feel a force? It's not in the magnetic field yet, so it's not going to feel a force at all. And so what you're going to have right here is a current going in this direction. Amber, that would be a clockwise current. So you will have an induced voltage in location B. I got a feature turned on that I want to turn off. How did I turn that? There. Sorry. Is that okay, Alfie? What about situation C? Hey, let's do our proton trick again, but this time... We'll have to look at that proton, and we'll have to look at that proton, because they're both in the magnetic field. Alfie, this front proton, what direction is it moving? What direction is the loop moving? To the? So point your right thumbs to the right. Magnetic field out of the page. Do you agree with me, Alfie? It's going to feel a force downwards in the front. What about this back proton? It's going to be the same thing, because it's also moving to the right. Magnetic field out of the page. It's going to feel a force downwards. 
when you have two identical currents going in opposite directions, you know what your net current is exactly as a number? Squadoosh. In fact, situation C and situation D, you're not going to get any induced voltage. You're not going to get a current. You will, however, get one in situation E, but in situation E, this time it's the back proton that's still in the magnetic field, still moving to the right, Carter. It's going to feel a force this way. As you leave the magnetic field, you're going to get a current in the counterclockwise direction. This gives you kind of an alternating current over an extended period of time. But you are going to get an induced voltage in situation E. So Faraday saw this and he had his, I've got it, aha moment. He said, I think I know how I can combine spinning something, moving something sideways, and moving the rod from the first lesson that we did. And it brings us to a concept called flux, magnetic flux. So to explain this, Faraday realized that a voltage, and therefore a current, in a coil of wire was induced when the area of the coil that was exposed to the magnetic field changed. This leads us to the concept of magnetic flux. So what's magnetic flux? It's the number of magnetic, stop, I'm going to abbreviate magnetic with capital B magnetic field lines passing through an area. It's the number of magnetic field lines passing through an area. More flux, more magnetic field lines are going through a given area. Symbol. A TIE fighter on its side, if you're a Star Wars fan. That's the Greek letter. I've heard it pronounced phi. I've heard it pronounced phi. I'll just call it flux. However, we, when we write it in a hurry, that's the way it shows up on a typewriter. In a hurry, when we handwrite it, we drop the wings. We just put a circle with a big vertical line through it. We don't put the little wings on there. And you're going to see I do that all the time. Units. Well, technically, lines, because it's the number of magnetic field lines passing through an area. Any flux is measured in lines. There isn't just magnetic flux. There is heat flux, light flux. All of those are different ways to measure intensity. Specifically for magnetic flux, here's your final brand new unit of the year, Weber's. Symbol, capital B, uh, sorry, capital W, lowercase b. I apologize for those of you at YouTube. This won't make sense to you. But those of you in my class, the way I imagine flux is I think about the size of a shadow on the wall. So here's my round shadow. The size of that shadow is the amount of light lines. Let's pretend instead of light, it's a magnet, magnetic field lines passing through this area. So more flux or less flux than before? Be obvious. Less, smaller area, smaller shadow. More flux or less flux? More. So how can we affect flux? There's two ways. One way, if we're talking magnets, is the magnetic field strength. If I move closer or further away from the magnet, that increases or decreases the flux. And all what's really then changing is how strong the magnetic field is. As you get closer, magnetic field gets bigger. As you move further away, magnetic field gets smaller. Uh, the other way is to change the area. So, hey, more flux, less flux same magnetic field strength at this location. Um, what would the flux be now exactly as a number? How many lines are going through this particular area? Joe, you're right, zero. Maximum flux, no flux. And this is how we can relate it to something that spins. It goes from max flux to no flux to max flux to, no, to negative max flux, if you want to put a vector direction on it.
Okay. So to calculate flux, this is on your formula sheet as well, but we're just going to add it right here. It's the magnetic field strength times the area that it's going through, but it's at its maximum when they're perpendicular to each other. If they're parallel to each other, if I have the lines going this way and the area going this way, what, oh, get it right, what's the flux exactly as a number here? Zero maximum. Oh, this also means because it's magnetic field times area, Weber's are technically Tesla meters squared. Tesla square meters. Magnetic field times area. So, example one says this, for each orientation of the spinning loop pictured below, what can be said about the amount of flux passing through the loop? Which of these, A, B, or C, will have the maximum flux? Which of these, B or C, will have the minimum flux? What about in B, if we assume these pictures are in chronological order, as we move from A to B to C, is the flux increasing or is the flux decreasing? Be obvious. Yeah, here we would say the flux is decreasing, especially if it's rotating in that direction. The exposed cross-sectional area is getting smaller. So this is going to let us put everything together, but first let's talk about how we figure out whether flux is increasing, decreasing, or constant. How can we change flux? So you need to imagine that this loop kind of continues around. I just got tired of trying to do the graphics. So if we're increasing the magnetic field, that would be like moving this projector closer to this area. Is that going to increase or decrease the flux? Also, because if it's magnetic field times area, if B gets bigger, flux gets bigger. What about if we decrease the magnetic field? Is flux increasing or decreasing? Yep. What about if the area that's experiencing the field decreases? If the area gets smaller, decreases? We're going to come back to D in a second. That's what we looked at last lesson, moving a rod along conducting wires. We'll come back to that. What about in situation E? What's happening to the flux here? Is the magnetic field changing? The amount of magnetic field that the area is experiencing, is that changing? Hey, no. Is its area changing? Here be constant not changing ooh what about diagram f if we move a north pole magnet closer to this area i'm going to tell you that's going to change the flux will that increase or decrease the flux adam what do you think yep same as doing this okay shadow gets bigger the area exposed gets bigger so flux would increase. Um, what about if we spin the coil? What's going to happen here? Will the flux get bigger or will the flux get smaller? Because we're going from maximum to minimum looking at the picture. So here, the flux would be decreasing. What about if we physically shrunk the area? Yeah. Let's go back to picture D. Here was Faraday's aha moment. He said here, the flux 
is increasing and it's increasing because the area behind the rod is increasing. That's the area that's increasing. That was his, ah, I can see how I can link that rod to what we're talking about here for flux. What about in situation I? Well, in situation I, we have a little coil of wire right here. It says the current is increasing. I think the first thing we should figure out is what's happening with the magnetic field. So we've got a current flowing in this direction. A single wire will create a magnetic field. Everybody point your right thumbs in the direction of the current. What direction is the magnetic field that's going through the coil right now? So imagine your fingers where that coil is. Which way are they pointing? Presley. I think you're right. Go like that. What direction are your fingers pointing? <laughs> Sorry? Out of the page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's draw that. I'm going to go out of the page, 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 out of the page. What do you think happens to that magnetic field as current gets bigger? Do you think the magnetic field is going to get bigger or smaller? bigger. And so what's going to happen to the flux bigger? That's another way to do the same thing electronically as moving this circle closer and closer to make the shadow bigger. You're increasing the strength of the magnetic field. Yeah, flux is going to increase. So previously we said that in, an induced voltage was created when we change the field or the orientation or the area in the field. Faraday summarized this, Jacob, by saying, you know what? We induce voltage when flux changes. When there is a change in flux, there will be an induced voltage. And if you hook it up to a circuit, an induced current. Faraday found three things. He found that the amount of induced voltage varies directly with the flux change. As the change in flux gets bigger, you get more voltage. In other words, change in flux is going to be on the top in our equation. He found it varied inversely with time. The faster you change the flux, the least amount of time, the bigger the voltage. It means there's going to be a T in the bottom of our equation. Oh, and he found it varied directly with a number of loops of wire. You want to double the voltage, put two loops of wire. You want to 100-fold the, the voltage, put 100 loops of wire. We're going to use N for loops of wire. And this brings us to Faraday's law. The induced voltage, we're going to use that funky EMF symbol, created by a coil, a spinning coil in a magnetic field, is equal to capital M, delta flux, over delta T, but it's negative. Why negative? We'll talk about that next lesson. Can you find where that is on your formula sheet? Okay, you found it. Uh, what does N mean? N is the number of loops of wire. In front of the flux symbol, put a delta, because it is a change in flux. What's change in anything? So it's going to be final flux minus the initial flux, except how do we calculate flux? Flux is what times what? Also on your formula sheet. So it's going to be BA final minus... BA initial, and remember that these are going to be perpendicular. Oh, and then delta T is the change in time. I like example three. I like example three. Example three is a nice question. Why would I say that? Did you hear me say it's going to be on the test? You just picked up on that? It's a dumb joke I do all the time with kids, but it works. Okay. A circular loop, okay, it's a circle. Let's remember that. A loop of wire of radius 2.5. Nice try, Duick. 
0.025 meters is in a magnetic field of 0.4 teslas. If the loop is removed from the field in a time of 0.05 seconds, what's the average induced EMF? Okay. Ella, what's this question asking me to find? Okay. Why do I say average? Ella, technically we're getting this, but I can't assume that you have the math skills to analyze that that yet. We're just going to find an average. Okay. Um, induced EMF is this. We have a coil inside a magnetic field. We're going to use negative N change in flux over change in time. Because this is a brand new equation, this is our first time, let's list things. What's N? How many coils of wire are there? They said, ah, uh. so how many coils of wire? One, a uh, circular loop of wire. And I can get the change in time pretty easy. Ella, what's the change in time? What I want to get now is the change in flux. That's going to be what I'm going to spend a lot of my time crunching. So, Ella, what's change in anything? So this is going to be B A final minus B A initial. Part of this isn't too bad. Ella, look at the picture. What's the final magnetic field? You have to look at yours I've because because I don't have it on here. What's the final magnetic field? Ah, what's the final flux? How many lines are going through the final as a number exactly? Yay, so I can at least do that. So it's going to be negative B area. What shape did they tell me? What's the area of a circle? If you can't remember, it is on your formula sheet. I did give it to you. Yes. And now I think we can actually crunch this. Negative, what was B? Was it 0. 0.4? Times pi times, was R 0. 0.025? Don't forget the squared. Negative 0.4 times pi times 0 0.025. Don't forget the squared. And I get a change in flux of negative 7.85 and change. I'll use my answer button. But I get negative 7.85 times 10 to negative 4. Units. It's our new unit of the day, Weber's. Okay, now I can walk that up to here. I'm going to drop everything down. So the EMF is going to be negative. What was N? 1. What was the change in flux? I'm going to write negative 7.85 times 10 to the negative 4. But you know I'm using my answer button. Divided by 0.0. Five. This is not a very good way to generate voltage and electricity. You're not going to get a big answer, but what do you get? I didn't do this in my head. I'm going from memory, but I think you get something like 0 0.015 or 0 0.014, something, something, something. Or is it 0 0.017? I can't remember. I know it's 0 0.01 something, I think, isn't it? You get a positive answer. What, what? Five, seven? Should do it. That's not much. Okay, you want more voltage? Add another wire. Now you've doubled it. Add a thousand wires. Now you've multiplied it by a thousand. You can really control the voltage that you're creating with this method. So it gives us really complete control. I said I like this question. Uh, actually, 
I really kind of like example four and five more. Example four, I like this question. It says a square wire of five centimeters on it. Nice try, Duick. 0 0.05 centimeters on a side has 100 turns. It lies perpendicular to a magnetic field of strength 0 0.02 Teslas. It's rotated through 90 degrees. Okay, if initially it's perpendicular and we rotate it 90 degrees, what's the final flux going to be as a number exactly? Okay, let's remember that. What's the average induced EMF? So we would say, hey, this is Faraday's law, negative N change in flux over change in time. Tony, what's N? Yep. What's delta T? I usually do those two first because they're usually fairly plug and chuggish. 2 times 10 to the negative 3, yes? And then I spend most of my time calculating the delta flux, the change in flux. So, change in flux, Tony, what's change in anything? And how do I find flux? Flux is what times what? It's on your formula sheet, which you should have out in front of you. The B BA, right? So it's going to be BA final minus BA initial. Oh, what did we say the final flux was, though, if it rotates perpendic from perpendicular to parallel? Yay. Okay. Um, it's going to be negative B. Ooh, area. What shape? Read carefully. The second word of the question starts with letter S. What? Okay, how do we find the area of a square? How do we find the area of a square? There's a reason we call it 3 squared and 5 squared and 12 squared. Adam, how do we find the area of a squared? Hey, well, it's just side squared. Yep. Yep. It's going to be 0 0.05 squared. Daniel, put it face down on the appropriate block. Thank you. All righty. Uh, what was it? 0 0.02 Teslas. So it's going to be 0 0.02 times 0 0.05, don't forget the squared. How big is the changing flux? Don't know. Oh, don't forget the negative, Mr. Duick. I got negative five times 10 to the negative five, is that right? Units, Weber's. And I can walk that over to here. It's going to be negative 100, negative 5 times 10 to the negative 5, divided by 2 times 10 to the negative 3. What'd you get, Jacob? 2.5 volts. Anybody else? I see one nod. Yeah, so this is a little more substantial. Now we're getting closer to like a battery. 2.5 volts. Most of your batteries are 1.5 volts, so that's something. Still not very efficient, though. So we can also change the flux by changing the magnetic field, but because magnetic field is a vector, we have to call one direction positive and one direction negative. Put your pencils down for a second look up. I got a couple of apps here. Uh, this is the first one I want to show you. So here I have a coil of wires. Is there anything happening right now? Do you see any current moving right now? No, because the flux isn't changing. How can I change the flux? I can move this closer or further from the 
magnet or I can move the magnet closer in and further in and you'll see while the flux is changing the light lights up. In fact, I actually have this toy. This is a little demonstrator model. It's transparent. You can see at the front, Jesse, I have a solenoid right here in the middle, coil of wires, a bunch of them. Here's a magnet, and as I move the magnet back and forth, folks, if you look at the end of the light, as I shake it, you can see that the light is turned on. Not very efficient. This is a terrible way to do it, but it's a proof of concept. I am generating electricity through motion. Way better would be if we can spin something by cranking a handle. We're going to get to there. But for now, okay, I can follow that. So if I want to turn this into a generator, if I want to spin something, here's a good one right here. So I have a rotating magnet, and here's my coil of wires. If I get something to rotate it like a water wheel, you can see... I've got alternating current back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Homework's going to be one, two, three, and four. If I want more current, I can just add more loops. So three loops, I've now added another 50% extra. Or here's another one. If we have something rotating the end of this, we can generate an oscillating, an alternating current of voltage that goes up and down like a sine wave. So on the end of this would be a water wheel or a steam engine or a modern day generators, they have a gasoline engine, but all you're doing is you're turning a coil of wires in a magnetic field and that gives you a nice alternating current. Pause. Okay. I really like example five. I really like example five. I really like example five. Example five is a nice question. A circular coil with 100 turns of wire is exposed to a changing magnetic field as shown below. If the field takes 0.12 seconds to change, what's the average induced voltage? Gibson, what I want you to notice is in the first diagram, the magnetic field is pointing which way? In the second, it's pointing which way? We're going to need to let one way be positive and one way be negative. What do you want to let be positive, up or down? Okay, so I'm going to do this, lazy but organized. I'm going to put a plus there, but I'm going to put a big positive in front of the 7.8. I'm going to put a minus. I'm going to put a big minus in front of the 5.4 so that there's no way I'll miss it. Gibson, what are they asking me to find? The induced voltage, I'm going to use Faraday's law, negative N, change in flux over change in time. Gibson, what's N? I'm not going to write that down. I'll substitute that in on the next line. Uh, what's T? Delta T. What's the change in time? That's what delta T is. Okay. I do these two first because they're pretty easy to find. I'm going to do the change in flux separately. In fact, I'll often just draw a little line down the middle of my page and I'll go, okay, Gibson, what's changing anything? And how do I find flux? BA. So it's going to be BA final minus BA initial. This time, none of these are zero. Okay. Change in flux. What's my final magnetic field, Gibson? Don't say 5.4. No. What's my final magnetic field, folks? Negative 5.4. Isn't that what you wrote? You put a big, huge negative in red in front of it, didn't you? Negative 5.4. Area. Did they give me the area? Sometimes they'll give you the area in square meters. You can just plop it down. Here again, they gave me the radius. And in fact, it says 10 centimeters. Nice try, Mr. Duick. 0.1 meters. What was the area of a circle? Do you remember? It's on your formula sheet too. Times pi times 0.1 squared minus magnetic field initial 7.8 positive uh, times pi times 0.1 squared. I'm going to find the change in flux. I'll just store it on my calculator, and then I'll walk it over to Faraday's law. Negative 5.4 
times pi times 0 0.1, don't forget the squared, minus 7.8 times pi times 0 0.1, don't forget the squared. By the way, it would have not have been wrong, Carter. You might have let up be negative and down be positive. You'll get a negative EMF in the homework. I'll accept either the positive or the negative value that you get. As long as you get the same magnitude as me, I'm fine with that. You get negative uh, 0.41469. Uh, I'll write 0.417. Sorry, 0 0.415. But I'll store this on my calculator. Is that right, folks? Yes, units, Weber's. Now let's walk over here. So the EMF is going to be negative. I've scrolled down, Gibson. What was M? What was M? Change in flux. I'm going to write negative 0.415, but you know I'm using my answer button. And what was the change in time? Delta T? Okay. How many volts will this system generate? What'd you get? I think you get something in the 300s, I think. 300. I think you get 346 if you round off properly, like an adult. You get 346, isn't it? If you use your answer button and go all the way through. You did extra work for more error? Wow. Loser. <clears throat> Sorry, something in my throat there. I think it's 346, right? And now we're getting, hey, that's a substantial voltage. I can do something with it. So my understanding is in modern generators, they do both. They spin the coil, and they also, if they can, rotate the outer magnetic field. Why not get way better, way better change in flux? May as well. In this equation, there are one, two, three, four variables. As far as I'm concerned, I can give you any three, find the fourth. I can even make you go hunting in here for an initial magnetic field or a final magnetic field. I think that's all fair game. Okay. Uh, example six says, rank the four loops below in order of increasing induced voltage from smallest voltage to biggest voltage what's going to affect the induced voltage the change in flux which of these has no change in flux and therefore no voltage a b c or d so first one b change in flux equals zero so voltage equals oh you know what let's use emf as my symbol mr duick all right. Which of these has the next smallest change in flux? That's a good question. How do we calculate flux? What times what? B times A. So which of these has the next smallest change in either its magnetic field or its area? D. Smallest change in flux. That's a terrible change in flux symbol. Which one has the next smallest change in flux, A or C? Yeah, C is going from full to half. A is going from full to zero. So I think the next is going to be C. Full flux to 0.5 flux and the next one is going to be a that goes from full flux to flux equals zero now we're assuming each of these took the same amount of time you could be pedantic and argue mr duick if they take different times that's going to change the equation fair enough and so i probably should have included in the instructions assume they each take the same amount of time remove that variable. All we're looking at is the change in flux. Uh, so technical comment, for induced voltage, if you're being asked to find an induced EMF, 
if it's a single rod or wire being pulled through a magnetic field for moving wires, use BLV. Uh, for coils, use Faraday's law. You can figure out a way to turn that second one into the first one. It contains it. It's a pain. I would just say, oh, use the, use the easier version. Okay. What's your homework? You can try number one. Uh, you can try number two. You can try number three. And you can try number four. And I'm going to hit pause there because a lot of you are still working on the homework from last day and you're working on your Playland Amusement Park physics. So you got about 15 minutes. You can probably get today's homework done in class. Let me hit stop.